Hey guys, today's lecture is going to be on the 14th chapter of Anatomy and Physiology, which is the Autonomic Nervous System and Homeostasis. I'm going to try to make this video as short and painless as possible, so let's get started. The autonomic nervous system is the involuntary branch of the PNS, peripheral nervous system. And remember that involuntary means to do something unconsciously or without will. So when you hear autonomic, think automatic. The autonomic division of the PNS carries out a lot of the functions in the body that are done automatically without will. The autonomic nervous system is also referred to as the visceral motor division of the PNS. And this is because it controls homeostasis of visceral organs such as the lungs, the heart, the stomach, just to name a few. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to make sure you guys understand how the autonomic nervous division fits into the nervous system as a whole. Now, the PNS has both a motor and sensory division with motor and sensory neurons. Some of these motor neurons are somatic. These somatic neurons innervate, meaning they supply nerves to skeletal muscles. This makes up the somatic motor division. Some of these motor neurons of the PNS are autonomic, meaning they innervate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. This makes up the autonomic nervous system. The ANS plays a huge role in homeostasis and making sure that physiological processes in the body are functioning properly and are stable. The ANS oversees vital functions of homeostasis such as heart rate, blood pressure, digestive processes, and urinary processes. These functions are performed through visceral reflex arcs, a series of events in which a sensory stimulus leads to a predictable motor response. Now, the difference between somatic reflexes and visceral reflexes is that visceral reflexes occur within the soft tissues of our organs. And just a brief example of that, defecation, for example, when someone eats, their body eventually goes through a digestive process that turns some of that food they ate into a waste product called feces. This is a process that is done in the soft tissue of the digestive tract. Now again, that was a brief example of the digestive process. It's way more detailed than that and you'll learn more about that in the digestive chapter of Anatomy and Physiology too. But let's just talk about visceral reflex arcs and how they work in general. So first, sensory signals from the viscera and skin are sent by afferent sensory neurons to the brain or spinal cord. And again, afferent means information is being sent toward the central nervous system. Two, the stimuli is then integrated by the CNS. Three, motor impulses from the central nervous system are sent out through efferent neurons and cranial and spinal nerves. So now we're talking efferently. Information is now being sent out from the central nervous system. These nerves usually lead to ganglia in the PNS called autonomic ganglia. Four, the autonomic ganglia send the impulses through other efferent neurons to different target organs where they will then trigger a motor response in the target cells. Okay, comparing the somatic division to the autonomic division starting with somatic. Somatic nerves innervate skeletal muscles and produce voluntary actions but some involuntary actions as well. Within the somatic division you'll find only one synapse before the nerve reaches its target cell. These somatic neurons release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. The somatic division has cholinergic receptors to respond to neurotransmitters. The autonomic division, on the other hand, innervates smooth and cardiac muscle cells and regulates glands, produces involuntary actions, and has two synapses. These autonomic neurons release epinephrine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine as its neurotransmitters. However, the receptors of the autonomic division are used based on the type of neurotransmitter that is released. For example, the cholinergic receptors respond to neurotransmitter acetylcholine, while adrenergic receptors respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine. And might I add, epinephrine is just another word for adrenaline and norepinephrine is just another word for noradrenaline, which explains why adrenergic receptors would be used for these type 
of neurotransmitters. The sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are main divisions of the ANS. The sympathetic nerves have short preganglionic axons but long postganglionic axons, while parasympathetic nerves have long preganglionic axons but short postganglionic axons. Now, there is also the enteric nervous system, which is also considered a main division of the ANS. Like if you've ever heard the saying, follow your gut, that's because there are actually nerve plexuses in the digestive tract. These plexuses that are there regulate smooth muscle contraction and gland secretion, but we're not going to focus on the enteric nervous system too much today. I'll definitely get that out in another video. The sympathetic nervous system is also called the thoracolumbar division due to its nerves originating in the thoracic and upper lumbar regions of the spinal cord. It's also called fight or flight because it gets the body prepared for emergency situations. For instance, if there is an attacker, will you fight this attacker off or will you run away? The sympathetic division of the ANS also functions to keep the body balanced during times of intense physical work, exercising for example. The sympathetic division functions in mediating the body's visceral response to emotion. The parasympathetic nervous system is often called the craniosacral division, and this is because the cell bodies of preganglionic sympathetic neurons originate in the brainstem and the sacral region of the spinal cord. It's also known as the rest and digest division because of its heavy role in digestion. The parasympathetic division also functions in homeostatic maintenance when the body is at rest and formation of urine. And please keep in mind that there are way more functions to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And we'll discuss those in just a minute, but we're only naming a few for now. So let's describe the anatomy of the sympathetic division. Postganglionic cell bodies are found in a series along the vertebral column, creating a chain-like appearance. This is actually what gives them their name, sympathetic chain ganglion. This ganglia extend beyond the thoracic and lumbar spinal cord. Preganglionic neurons originate in the lateral horns of the thoracic and lumbar spinal cord. Preganglionic axons exit the spinal cord along with the axons of the lower motor neurons through something called the anterior root. After leaving the anterior root, these neurons will travel along the spinal nerve and the anterior ramus for a short distance before they branch off to form small nerves called white rami communicants. And keep in mind that white means myelinated. The axons in white rami communicants then enter the sympathetic chain ganglia that house cell bodies of postganglionic sympathetic neurons. Some of these neurons pass through the sympathetic chain ganglia without synapsing. Instead, they'll just synapse closer to their target organ on cell bodies in collateral ganglia. Most collateral ganglia are located near the aorta, one of the great vessels of the heart, naming the ganglia the pre-aortic ganglia. Other collateral ganglia are located near organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity. The preganglionic axons located here have a name called the splanchnic nerves. These nerve synapses in ganglia such as celiac ganglion, superior mesenteric ganglion, and inferior mesenteric ganglion. So remember that a synapse allows electrical or chemical information to be transferred from one nerve or cell to another. A preganglionic neuron can synapse with a postganglionic neuron in one of three ways. The axon can synapse with a postganglionic neuron in sympathetic chain ganglia. The axon can descend or ascend and synapse with a postganglionic neuron in a completely different chain ganglion or the axon may pass through the chain ganglion and synapse with a postganglionic neuron and a collateral ganglion. No matter which tactic the preganglionic neuron uses, the postganglionic neuron will then innervate its target cell. Some of the postganglionic axons exit the ganglia as tiny gray communicants that rejoin and travel with spinal nerves to reach their target cells. However, postganglionic neurons that take the first two pathways mentioned above exit through the gray rami communicants, whereas those who take the third pathway travel directly to their target cells. Remember that neurons communicate with one another through chemicals called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters interact with their target cells by binding to a protein-based receptor embedded in the plasma membrane of their target cells. 
Neurotransmitters are released by the preganglionic exon at the synapse. Acetylcholine is the most frequently used transmitter within the sympathetic division of the ANS. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are other classes of neurotransmitters used in the sympathetic nervous system. And as we stated earlier guys, adrenergic receptors are named due to its ability to bind to adrenaline and noradrenaline. And then we have the cholinergic receptors to bind to acetylcholine. Now adrenergic receptors have their own classes of receptors, alpha receptors and beta receptors. Both are classified by their protein structure. Alpha-1 receptors located in the plasma membranes of smooth muscle cells. Alpha-2 receptors are mostly found in the membranes of preganglionic neurons versus a peripheral target cell. Alpha-2 receptors can bind to norepinephrine, aka noradrenaline, causing the preganglionic neuron to hyperpolarize. This decreases the amount of acetylcholine being released and decreases postganglionic activity. There are three types of beta receptors, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. Beta-1 receptors are found in the plasma membranes of cardiac muscle cells. You'll also find these receptors in certain kidney cells and in adipose tissue. Beta-2 receptors found in the plasma membrane of smooth muscle cells lining the airway passages of the lungs. Found too on skeletal muscle fibers, smooth muscles of the urinary bladder, liver, pancreas, and plenty of other places. Beta-3 receptors are located mostly on the cells of adipose tissue and smooth muscle cells that are found in the walls of the digestive tract. All right, on to another class of sympathetic receptors, cholinergic. Cholinergic receptors have two main types, muscarinic and nicotinic. Muscarinic receptors bind to the poison called muscarine. The nicotinic receptors bind to the poison found in tobacco. These receptors are found in the membranes of all postganglionic neurons within the sympathetic ganglia and adrenaline medulla. Let's talk about the functions of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic division's primary goal is to maintain homeostasis during times of physical and emotional stress. Some of the functions the sympathetic division may carry out to maintain homeostasis during periods of increased activity includes increasing heart rate and the amount of blood delivered to tissues, constricting blood vessels, this is a process called vasoconstriction, dilating the bronchioles of the lungs to deliver more oxygen to tissues, dilating skeletal and cardiac blood vessels to distribute more oxygen and nutrients. This is a process known as vasodilation. Contraction of urinary and digestive sphincters. This is why emptying the bowel and bladder is hard during times of stress, exercise, and emergency. Relaxation of the smooth muscle in the digestive tract. This slows down the digestive process. Dilation of the pupils, which allows more light into the eye during high sympathetic activity. The sympathetic division can too cause vessels of most exocrine glands to constrict. This is why a lot of times when an individual gets nervous, their mouth may begin to feel dry due to the lack of blood supply. This division increases the release of blood sugar during increased metabolic activity and is also responsible for increased sweat excretion, semen ejaculation, contraction of the skeletal muscles, which explains why a person can get unusual strength when they have an adrenaline rush. And sympathetic activity causes contraction of erector pili muscles, causing goosebumps. The adrenal glands sit on top of each kidney. The adrenal medulla is the internal portion of the adrenal gland and functions as a ganglion. This is because the adrenal medulla of the adrenal gland is made up of glandular epithelium or modified sympathetic postganglionic neurons. The adrenal medulla also acts as a backup for the sympathetic nervous system. Say if the pathways connecting the sympathetic nervous system with many of its target organs are disrupted, it can still affect these organs indirectly through the adrenal medulla. This is how it's done. After acetylcholine is released by the preganglionic neuron, it binds to nicotinic receptors of the adrenal medulla cells. Acetylcholine will then stimulate the medullary cells to release more epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. You guys are going to learn more about this in the endocrine chapter, but once these neurotransmitters enter the bloodstream, they then become hormones, which are long-distance chemical messengers. So the adrenal medulla, or the adrenal gland as a whole rather, is a very special organ in my opinion because it acts as a mediator between the nervous system and the endocrine system. The parasympathetic division functions in periods of rest. 
Recall that the parasympathetic nervous system is also called the craniosacral division. This is because both the cranial and sacral nerves are involved in parasympathetic function. The parasympathetic cranial nerves innervate most of the visceral organs of the thoracic and abdominal pelvic cavities. Let's look at the cranial nerves that help with parasympathetic function. The vagus nerve, the main sympathetic nerve that innervates the thoracic and abdominal viscera. Parasympathetic fibers of the ocular motor nerves. Synapse on terminal ganglia called the ciliary ganglia. Submandibular and pterygopalatine ganglion house the cell bodies of sensory neurons. They're also where preganglionic neurons of the facial nerve synapse on postganglionic sympathetic neurons. We have preganglionic parasympathetic neurons of the glossopharyngeal nerves synapsing on postganglionic parasympathetic neurons in small terminal ganglia called the otic ganglia. Parasympathetic sacral nerves innervate the last segment of the large intestine, urinary bladder, and reproductive organs. Branches of the sacral spinal cord form the pelvic splanchnic nerves, which in turn form plexuses in the pelvic floor. Some preganglionic neurons synapse in terminal ganglia within these plexuses, but most synapse in terminal ganglia in the walls of the organs. Now let's talk about the neurotransmitters and receptors that are found in the parasympathetic division of the ANS. Preganglionic and postganglionic parasympathetic neurons both release acetylcholine at their synapses, which leads to an excitatory effect. Remember from the sympathetic division, we said that there are two types of cholinergic receptors, nicotinic and muscarinic. The same applies for the parasympathetic division. Nicotinic receptors in the parasympathetic division are located in the membranes of all postganglionic parasympathetic neurons, whereas you'll find muscarinic receptors in the membranes of the parasympathetic target cells. The parasympathetic nervous system's main goal is to maintain homeostasis when the body is at rest. So let's talk about some of the effects of the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember that the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate and blood pressure. The parasympathetic nervous system will work to decrease heart rate and blood pressure. Preganglionic parasympathetic neurons travel to the heart through the vagus nerve and stimulate postganglionic neurons to reduce the rate of the heart's contractions. This in turn will lower blood pressure. Other parasympathetic functions, constricting the pupils to let less light into the eye, making the lens of the eyes less round, allowing accommodation for near vision. The parasympathetic division also causes the airways to narrow. This is a process called bronchoconstriction. You'll learn more about that in anatomy and physiology too. The parasympathetic division triggers contraction of the smooth muscles of the digestive tract, producing rhythmic contractions to help propel ingested food. This is a process called peristalsis. It relaxes digestive and urinary sphincters to promote urination and defecation. Engorgement of the penis or clitoris by widening the blood vessels. Now the parasympathetic division has little to no effect on glands, but it does however trigger copious secretion. And might I add, the parasympathetic division does not innervate any blood vessels, except specific areas of the body like those found in reproductive organs. But some blood vessels do dilate when the parasympathetic nervous system is active, like the vessels found in the urinary and digestive system. The parasympathetic division unlike the sympathetic division, has no direct effect on cells that mediate metabolic rate, mental alertness, skeletal muscle cells, blood clotting, adipocytes, or endocrine secretions. It's really just that some of these factors return to a resting state, not so much due to the parasympathetic nervous system being on, but simply because the sympathetic nervous system is not active. And during this time, the body is just storing glucose and other fuels to get ready for the next round of sympathetic activity. So let's talk about how the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions interact with one another. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system don't function separately. Instead, they work together to maintain this beautiful goal of homeostasis. Both divisions innervate the same organs, but will each have the opposite effect on that organ. This is something we like to call dural innervation. The sympathetic nervous system is dominant and triggers effects that maintain homeostasis during exercise or emergencies. The parasympathetic nervous system regulates the same organs as the sympathetic nervous system and preserves homeostasis after exercise or emergencies. 
So you know that relaxed feeling you get after a really good workout that's normally the parasympathetic nervous system taking its course. The term autonomic tone means that neither division of the autonomic nervous system is ever completely turned off. Sympathetic tone is dominant in blood vessels and keeps them partially constricted at all times. This maintains blood pressure during periods of rest. Parasympathetic tone is dominant in heart rate and keeps the heart rate at an average of 72 beats per minute. The parasympathetic nervous system also controls the urinary and digestive systems to make sure these systems are at their normal levels. Okay guys, remember from the CNS chapter that functions of homeostasis are largely controlled by the hypothalamus and the brainstem reticular formation. Also recall that the hypothalamus sends signals to areas of the reticular formation. These areas are called autonomic sensors. Autonomic sensors contain neurons that control the activity of preganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. Autonomic pathophysiology, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, also known as POTS. When someone stands up, the sympathetic division will temporarily dilate or widen the blood vessels to increase blood flow. Now, the sympathetic division does this to make sure blood flow remains constant against the force of gravity. Afterwards, the sympathetic division will reduce its activity and the parasympathetic division will come in and do its job to bring the blood pressure back down to its normal state. However, when an individual has POTS, the parasympathetic division arrives late, making the duration of sympathetic activity after standing longer. POTS is characterized by an abnormal increase in heart rate, accompanied by vasodilation of blood vessels when a patient stands after sitting or lying down. This happens due to a change in gravity. Symptoms may include dizziness, lightheadedness, fatigue, and thirst. What causes POTS is unknown, but it appears to be secondary to excessive sympathetic activity or sensitivity to epinephrine and norepinephrine. Treatment can include dietary modification. This may consist of an increase in water or salt intake, exercise, or medication to block sympathetic receptors, or all of the above. Speaking of medications that block sympathetic receptors, let's talk a little bit about pharmacology and the sympathetic nervous system, and then I'll let you guys go. The various subtypes of sympathetic nervous system receptors has allowed researchers to design drugs that are specific to individual receptor types. The receptors of the sympathetic nervous system treat so many different medical conditions such as hypertension and asthma. Most of these drugs work in one of two ways, as agonists or antagonists. Antagonists work by blocking the receptor to stop norepinephrine from being released, whereas agonists work by binding to the receptor and then mimicking the effects of norepinephrine. Agonists and antagonists can come in the form of an alpha or beta. Alpha-1 blockers are antagonists and they bind to the alpha-1 receptors on smooth muscle cells that line blood vessels. Antagonist alpha-1 blockers are used to treat hypertension and this is done by preventing the blood vessel from constricting. Alpha-1 blockers are also used to relax the prostate gland to treat benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Alpha-2 agonists bind to presynaptic alpha-2 receptors and activate them. Alpha-2 agonists do this to decrease sympathetic neuron output, and these drugs are used to treat hypertension and opioid withdrawal. Beta blockers are antagonists. They bind to beta-1 receptors on the heart to decrease heart rate and the force of contraction. Antagonistic beta blockers are used to treat hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases. Beta-2 agonists bind to beta-2 receptors on smooth muscles of the airways and cause bronchodilation. These drugs are commonly used to treat asthma. The sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions antagonize one another. For example, the sympathetic neurons may increase heart rate while the parasympathetic neurons will work to bring that heart rate back down. Together, they'll both bring a delicate balance to the body to make sure homeostasis is being maintained. All right, guys, that's the end of our lecture on the autonomic nervous system and homeostasis. Please be sure to like, comment, share, subscribe, and remember to never give up.